All right, let's get into the presentation then go to the next slide. Um, so what we're talking about today is the, uh, the champion program, how to find a living donor. And I went through that search process for Samantha back in 2007. All these things are things that, that we did in 2007. Uh, and then we've worked with hundreds of uh, donors and patients since then uh, to execute very similar uh, searches. So these things are proven to work. Uh, they're learnable, they're teachable. Uh, and the results are, are pretty, pretty solid. Uh, so we think that if you can implement uh, these techniques, these strategies, uh, that you will find a living donor. And most uh, who really execute on this will find a living donor within the next year. Uh, so we'll start with the ideal donor search team. Um, you've got to put together a team to do this. Uh, so um, you can't do it by yourself. If you're the patient, what you want to do is find people around you that can fill these roles. And so you can see that the patient is the middle of the team. Um, above the patient, you have the administrator. Below the patient, you have the caretaker. And to the left of the patient, you have the coach. And then in the blue circles, you have one or more champions. Now, a person can uh, perform multiple roles in this team. So, for example, when Samantha was the patient, I was the administrator and I was also the champion or one of the champions. Uh, my wife, Jan, she was the caretaker for Samantha, and she was also one of the champions. We didn't have a coach back then, um, and Samantha will talk more about the role of the coach, uh, but a, a person can perform more than one role. And also the patient uh, can perform um, these roles too. The patient can be their own administrator. Um, the patient can act as a champion. Um, uh, we recommend that uh, the patient find a, a champion in addition to maybe they want to do some outreach, but we think that it's more powerful to have somebody else be the champion. And the champion's job, their job is to find donor candidates. Um, so that's the team. Uh, this slide just kind of articulates uh, those roles a little bit better. Let me pause here and take uh, questions about that donor search team. Any questions about what I just talked about around the donor search team and the team uh, roles? No. I don't believe so. Okay, we're going to move There to the was next. one question in the chat. Um, uh, is this PowerPoint going to be available? Uh, we won't be able to email this um, as it's an ever-changing document, so we'll be up to date, but we will be sending out the recording um, of this event after uh, about a, a week or two uh, after the event. Tonight. Will that be a, a YouTube video that they get? Uh, it'll be a Zoom file. A Zoom file. Okay. Uh, good. Next slide. Um, so what does a coach do? So when my wife and I were running the donor search uh, campaign for Samantha, we didn't have a coach that hadn't been invented yet. We have them now. In fact, there, I think we may have one or two uh, coaches online. Actually, We actually have um, almost all of our coaches are, are online today. So uh, we have uh, Leanne Saylor, we have Terry Bennett, we have uh, Brian and Marie Drain, and we have uh, Debbie Parrish, all of our coaches. All right, good. So any of any, uh, the uh, Microsite patients on the line tonight have questions. Um, we have actual coaches online uh, to answer those questions. So what does a coach do? A coach is somebody who's gone through this journey. Either they were uh, a transplant recipient and they organized the search campaign and assembled the team for themselves, uh, or they were maybe a spouse or somebody close uh, to uh, the recipient. Like, you know, I was Sam's dad, so I was uh, kind of uh, involved in that process. So a coach is somebody with intimate experience about the process. They're an expert. They can help motivate and inform uh, the patient about uh, the process of finding a living donor. And also they help navigate the transplant process uh, because the transplant systems are complicated. They're kind of overwhelming at times. And so the coach is somebody who's in your corner to help you kind of achieve the goal of, of finding a living donor and uh, getting a transplant. Um, they'll answer questions like, what should I say to potential donors? Who can I ask to be a donor? What do I write on my microsite? You know, and the rest of these blurbs up there. So they're a source of information and also a source of motivation. 
And if anybody does not um, currently have a coach um, who's on this call tonight, uh, please contact your either contact your transplant center coordinator and request a coach, or you can actually go in and request a coach yourself. Uh, there's a button on your weekly email uh, that allows you to do that. Perfect. Next slide. Um, so, next slide. All right. So, the champion. All right, the champion's job in that team is to find potential living donors. The champion's job is to reach out. Uh, and so what do champions, and I put champions and patients, who do they reach out to? Uh, because even if a patient has one or two champions that are in the team, the patient's still gonna be reaching out, certainly the family members and whatnot. So um, who do you reach out to? Well, everybody has a circle of influence, and at the center of that circle of influence is family members, right? Your immediate family, your extended family uh, is where you want to start, right? That's the logical. As soon as Samantha uh, was diagnosed with end-stage renal disease, I was calling my brothers and my sister, uh, and, and my wife was doing the same thing. We were immediately reaching out uh, to family members. Then we went to cousins. We went to nephews. Um, so... We broadened it over time. So you start with the family um, because that's your, you know, highest uh, probability uh, area to find a donor. But the reality is you may not have any family members that are qualified or step up. So then you expand that circle out to your friends, right? Go to your close friends then go to your maybe not so close friends. And then uh, you go out to the acquaintances and then you go out to strangers. So you're you're working out from the family out uh, so that you're making sure that the highest, uh, the people that have the highest propensity to donate, which are gonna be family, friends, that's where you wanna spend your initial time. Uh, but you don't wanna necessarily just spend all your time there. If you're not having success, you wanna expand out. And obviously the number of people, the number of potential donors increases as you get further out in that circle. Um, you have a limited number of family, right? But there's an unlimited number of strangers. And we'll talk about strategies to, uh, to reach those folks. So next question we always get is, what do you say to potential donors, right? So you're, you're talking to a family member, you're talking to an acquaintance, a coworker. What do you say? Well, when you're talking to family members, what I found was the most successful is you're going to be a little bit more blunt. You know, I call my brother and I say, hey, Donald, would you be willing to be tested to see if you are qualified to donate? Right. It's straight to the point. Now, you have to judge uh, who the family member is and, and how direct you want to be. But generally, with family members, you're going to be a little bit more direct. You're going to be a little less direct, maybe with friends. And as you get to acquaintances and certainly strangers, um, you know, you could be off-putting if you go up to a stranger and say, would you be willing to be tested to see if you're medically qualified to donate? I don't recommend that. When you're talking with a stranger or you're talking to an acquaintance, it's better to say something like, I'm looking for a kidney donor. Can you help me find a living donor by sharing my story? So you're only asking them to share the story. Now, if somebody has a propensity to want to donate a kidney, they've already thought about it. It's not something that just entered their mind when you talk to them about sharing your story. And if they're serious, you've asked them to share their story. Uh, we've had many cases where they step forward then to be tested to donate. And so you don't have to ask them if they want to donate or if they want to be tested, just ask them to share your story. And if they have a, that propensity uh, they will probably step forward. Uh, so again, you've got this spectrum out there. Family, you're going to be a little more direct. Strangers, you're going to ask them to share your story. And then kind of in between, we've got, you know, some suggestions here in between. But the general concept is uh, the less familiar you are with the person, the more uh, we're recommending that you just ask that person to share your story. And you can share that story via the microsites because you've already written your story on the microsite uh, web page. Uh, so let me, let me pause there. Uh, go back to the prior slide. Questions on what do you say to potential donors? Anybody have any questions on that? And let me ask, do we have any coaches out there that would expand on what you would say to potential donors? 
Am I unmuted? This is Leanne. Leanne, yes, you're on. on. Go ahead. Okay. I have found in our experience that anything you can wear to catch the attention of somebody to start a conversation with a random person, even um, our, we, we wear wristbands that say, you know, living donors and things like that. Um, I don't go anywhere out of my house without a t-shirt on that says, you know, something about looking for living donors. Um, a, a donate life button because if you're in the grocery store and somebody behind you says oh what, what who what what's your situation with with the donor situation thinking it's just going to be a not just but a deceased kidney story and then i'll go into our story and then it's actually led to finding um many donors that way just having something to spark that conversation yeah and then just for the benefit uh, of the patients on this call who may be initiating a donor search campaign Leanne, shed some light on, I mean, there's a lot of hope in what you guys have been able to accomplish in your organization. How many living donor transplants do you think you've facilitated uh, by kind of employing these, these strategies? We will be doing our 76th transplant on October the 18th. It's hard to, to, to take them down to figure out because about probably 15 to 20 of those people did get a deceased kidney while waiting, but we have had a lot of success and um, if somebody has come forward to give somebody they know a kidney and then they weren't a match, but they're still qualified as healthy enough, we ask those people to pray about whether they would consider giving it to someone else. And most of those people come forward and, you know, once they felt moved, they, they feel like they can go ahead and we explain to them how if they were to give a kidney to a stranger, it's going to help that person they were trying to help, as well as maybe 20 people down the row uh, with paired donation. All right, so just, I just want to focus in on that number. You said 76. Yeah. Uh, so the folks on the call, these the, the coaches that we have on the call, the coaches that are, you're connecting into, if you haven't done so already, um, this, this is, this is, these are the kind of numbers. These are significant numbers that shows you there's a lot of hope. There's a lot of possibility uh, to find a living donor. Um, and so, that, you know, it, it's, it's uh, I think it's significant uh, that, that the coaches have been able to facilitate so many transplants. Right. But just for some background on, on who Leanne is and um, why we asked the coaches to speak and, and what she was talking about is both us as an organization. Uh, Leanne runs our coaching partner program called Mulligan's Living Kidney Donors. Um, and they have been around for about uh, eight years now uh, doing this independently. Uh, we met them about a year ago and have, have since formed a partnership. So they've been doing this for a while and obviously they've gotten great success. So that's who you're getting as a coach is somebody who's done this um, and had great success, not only with themselves or their family, uh, but also uh, with other people uh, who they've met. In lives. All right, next slide, please. Um, so methods of communications, Leanne just talked about wear a button, wear a t-shirt. So you've got kind of left to right, uh, you know, different methods of communication, t-shirt, apparel, bumper stickers, billboards. Um, and then you've got, you know, the way to spread the word, social media posts, church, local organizations, television, local news. Um, and then the direct ask, talk in person, phone calls, email, and text. Again, when I was doing the search, uh, the most powerful is when you talk directly to somebody, uh, but you run out of people to talk to. And as Leanne pointed out, you could be in the grocery store with a t-shirt on um, and somebody's going to talk to you about, you know, what does that mean? To, you know, uh, be a living donor or whatever it is. And so uh, we encourage every, people to employ all these techniques to get the word out. And another uh, important thing to note on this is we don't, we don't advocate for um, reinventing the wheel. Uh, what do I mean by that? If you have somebody in your life, um, say, you know, your best friend, and you're trying to talk to them about this. And the only real way that you guys talk is via text. You know, if you're going to call them, they're not going to answer just because that's not their method of communication. Don't reinvent the wheel and try to call them or do an in-person talk if that's not something that you have historically done. Text them because if that's what works, do that. 
And I, I will come up with a, with another um, suggestion I forgot to mention. We've had a very diverse, different group of people that have used it in different ways because we don't all have the same center of influence. We have a gentleman that's a semi driver that he had a big cover made for the very back of his, for the back of his semi, and he drove around the country saying, "My wife needs a kidney." He had all the contact information on there. Not only did he find a kidney for his wife, but now his daughter is getting her kidney that way too. So just think out of the box. Anything you can think. Up. I've seen them on horse trailers, quite honestly, on the highway. <laughs> All right. Blue too, hot air balloon. Excuse me. Yes. Go ahead. I just have to ask a quick question. So, um, we do not have a coach for Annette Rights. This, um, this is her daughter-in-law speaking. Um, I'm on your website, and it says that the donor search expert coach is in the pilot phase. So, are you saying that it is not out of the? It's out of the pilot phase. We can request coaches through you, or how do we get a coach? Absolutely. Um, I will change that on the website. It's not, it's, we, we call it in the pilot phase because we didn't have that many coaches um, about a year ago when we created that page. Uh, but we do have enough coaches for everybody on here to have a coach. Um, the way to do it is um, your, your mother-in-law will be getting, gets an email each week um, showing this, the stats for her microsite. Um, there, one of the buttons on that email uh, will say request a coach or something similar. Just hit that button and you should be uh, paired with a coach within a few days. Okay. Or, or, or our, she, our microsite was just finalized. So we'll, should we have gotten that email that says request a coach? Um, if you haven't already, um, then you'll get it once a week. Um, if not, reach out to your transplant coordinator and they'll be able to uh, request a coach as well. Okay. But I'll actually, since you're online, uh, I dried down your name. So I'll just uh, connect you with a coach uh, right after this. Okay. Thank you so much. Sure. Other questions? All right, Sam, you want to take these next set of slides? Sure. So many of you obviously have microsites. Um, however, you probably might have different uh, versions of them. There are two types of site, sites, a starter site and a custom site. Um, the starter site is for those who are a little more hesitant about creating their story and um, putting their story online. The custom uh, allows pictures and their personal story. We highly recommend creating a custom site, uh, but, uh, you know, starter sites are perfectly fine as well, um, and they do work. Um, so the important part about a microsite is that bottom part, that bottom piece uh, where it says your donation links, uh, because that means that's where your potential don donors can go to see if they're medically qualified to donate. So that's the important part uh, of your microsite. That's where you want to point donors towards or potential donors towards. It's that that button down at the bottom. This is obviously the custom microsite uh, examples, and these are, are some beautiful ones. Uh, we highly, again, we highly recommend a custom because the more you have of yourself on that site, the more potential there is for somebody to, to connect with you and say, oh, for example, if you're um, a big knitter, oh, well, I love knitting too. I want to help this person because they're like me. Or um, I know the coaches are big proponents of adding where you went to high school and where you went to college or football teams that you, that you work with, local organizations that you work with. Again, that's another point of connection between you and any potential donor. And, and this is where the coach can help you go through this because the coaches have set up many of these sites. Uh, so we encourage you to, to reach out to the coach and, and get their input as you put your story together. All right, next slide. All right, and then uh, every every microsite that goes live um, as a starter site uh, gets 250 of these business cards that advertise your name and your site URL. Um, it's very important to get these out in the community, um, get these to, to friends um, and family members. Um, the coaches have actually started um, really pushing towards family and friends taking pictures of this card so that they can post it to their social media and get you even more reach. All right. All right, so now let's say that your microsite is live. Um, you want to use that microsite to get the word out. So how do you do that? It's really straightforward. Um, each microsite has a unique URL. Uh, you copy that URL. You email that uh, link to friends, family, people that you know. You know, you put a you know personalized message with it. Put a little a thought into it. Again, we talked about the messaging earlier. Kind of what you say to a person depending on their 
where they are in your circle of influence. You can also text that link to people. You can share that link on social media. You can hand out the cards that Samantha just talked about because the cards have that URL on there. You could be at a Starbucks and somebody says, hey, what's that button about on your shirt? You hand them a card. You want to make sure that they have the specific location where your uh, web page is at. And that'll be on the business cards. You can also leave stacks of business cards, you know, these cards. You can leave them at, at work, community center, public places, uh, wherever you think they might uh, be useful. So uh, in the physical world, those cards are really helpful. In the electronic world, that link is really helpful. So use the, the card and the link to get that word out. This is also, the cards are also very helpful um, for those who may be uh, a little, little more hesitant to fully engage with somebody in, in real life and, and talk about their, their whole story and their whole journey because they can say, oh, to learn more about me, you can go here. Or to learn more about this, you can go here. It also allows for, you know, a five minute um, elevator pitch basically for back, lack of a better term, where it's, you know, this is what's going on to learn more, here you go. And again, uh, if it's somebody that you're not, you know, really close to, you may be just handing that card out saying, oh, please, uh, Pass this, uh, get the word out. Please help me share my story. And my story is at this, the link on the card. All right, next slide. Uh, so uh, one of the things that I, I found was extremely helpful when we were doing our donor search campaign is that we kept a list of all potential donors, people that we talked to. Um, so my wife had her list. I had my, we consolidated one list. We had an Excel spreadsheet. You can put it on a hard copy piece of paper, uh, but you want to make sure that you've got kind of a list of all the folks that you've talked to uh, and then what their status is and kind of what the next step is. Now, this also gets into a tricky area of uh, kind of health privacy, because once that donor is connected with the transplant center, the transplant center can't tell you uh, what's going on, you know, because there's privacy laws. Uh, so what you want to do is you want to get them to the transplant center. The best way to get them to the transplant center is have them go to your microsite page, click on that button saying, you know, I want to register, be a donor, whatever that button says. And they enter their information. As soon as they put that stuff in, you know, it's, it's connecting back to the transplant center you're kind of done at that point, right? Because once the transplant center is involved, um, they, they can't, the transplant center can't tell you the blow by blow on how that donor is going through the process. You can, you can check in with the donor candidate every once in a while. You don't want to check in too often. Um, you know, it's an interesting balance. Like with my brother, I could, I could call him every day if I wanted. But if it was somebody that I talked to at work, I got to be a little more careful. So um, this list of potential donors is kind of key. Uh, you always want to know kind of all the folks that you've talked to who may have connected through the transplant center. Uh, so you can organize who you talk to next. You can add to the list. Any questions on this slide? I have a magnetic sign on my car. Mm -hmm. and I have people ask about it. What, would, what suggestion would you give for putting on a t-shirt? What would you put on the t-shirt? Leanne, I think I'll you're ask, the best one I'll to take the, this one. I'm actually, if, if you all can open the thing up, Michelle, I've got my Mulligan's t-shirt on now. Unfortunately, we can't do video as this is set up as a webinar. Um, most people, <laughs> most people just come up with their own little catchy, catchy phrase. Um, these shirts that I came up with for, we started ours as an organization 10 years ago after my husband's transplant and we named ourselves Mulligan's Living Kidney Donors. I won't go into why there was a reason, but the t-shirts that I wear, they, and most of our people do Mulligan's Living Kidney Donors, share your spare. And then on the back is a huge orange kidney with the word kidney written all different ways in it people can do anything they want we thought this was catchy because people were like what's that mean share share your spare but i've got people that have gone so far as need kidney here's phone number um i would encourage you to be a little bit more um creative than that because you know that's kind of just kind of bland but you know anything at all anything catchy i can't remember um one little girl that we had that her, her mom was was really on a on a quest for her she drew on well she made a t-shirt and pointed down to where the kidney goes and it said i need your kidney to help me live and the arrow was right there on the t-shirt and then contact information just any anything at all that you find that's catchy 
it works. I would recommend also putting your microsite link on anything That's that you, you do, your shirt, your, your uh, car magnet sign. Um, this way, you don't have to necessarily have your contact information out there, but you have that, that microsite link so that any potential donors can go to that link and hit that, that button that says register to donate. Yeah, keep in mind that some potential donors may be a little bit intimidated by calling a phone number and talking to a human. Um, it's a little less intimidating if they just key in uh, the website and they can read your story online. So you want to give them all options. Um, uh, any other comments on this one? I do feel like it's very hopeful for the people that are waiting for a kidney to know that if that microsite's on that shirt, they may not know that people are, you know, who's in, individually is calling in about it, but there probably might be 10 people that are inquiring that you might not know about. So I felt found that is very, it gave us a lot of hope. Uh, Marie, you also have a, a suggestion on that? Marie's one of our other coaches. You could unmute, please. Marie, looks like you're unmuted, so. All right, let's move on. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> All right, so some donor search tips. Um, so I'm going to go through one by one. Uh, potential. The first thing is, this may be obvious to some people, but I, I've seen situations where uh, this has created some problems. Potential champions should have a clear reason why they can't donate. Uh, this is one of the first things that pops into a donor's, a potential donor's mind. You know, you're looking for a kidney for your spouse, for example. Why can't you donate? Um, now, you don't want to necessarily divulge personal information, but um, it's a question that comes up uh, and, it, and it's not often it's not even vocalized. Uh, uh, so, uh, you know, obviously somebody who's older, somebody who's in their 70s or 80s, uh, they're going to be past the age limit. But although we do have many 70 year old 70, I think we had a 78 year old donor we did. We had uh, two. come in. <laughs> Uh, you know, if you've already donated a kidney, well, that's a great champion, right? So if I'm, if I'm helping somebody find a donor, it's really, I, I donated my kidney, I only have one left, right? So that's a real good reason why I'm not a donor for this person that I may be the champion for. Uh, so it's just something to consider. Um, here's another thing, and this is more of a mindset than anything else. Never say you have a donor until the surgery is done. I have seen uh, surgeries fall apart. I was, I was within 36 hours of donating my kidney to Samantha in 2007, and I was taken out because she developed an antibody against my B60 antigen. So I had failed the final cross match. She would have rejected my kidney. You can't predict those kind of things. We've seen donors get knocked out because they were hiking in the woods and got bitten by an animal two days before surgery and they couldn't go through surgery uh, because the animal bite had some weird ramifications. So there are a lot of things that can happen at the last minute. And if you, if you start to broadcast that, Oh, I, you know, I'm looking for a donor, but I already have one. Now people are just going to say, right. Oh, they got a donor. I'm going to move on. So don't say that you have a donor until you've had your transplant. Um, Especially because since there have been times, and we've seen them throughout our history of facilitating care exchange, where the mid-surgery, they stop the surgery because, you know, the donor has too much scar tissue or something happens with the anesthesia yeah, or something, it's, and it can't go through. It's so rare, but it, it does happen. Even once the donor surgery has started, they have to back out because of, of medical complications. So, and again, don't tell other potential donors that you have a donor because you don't. You don't have a donor until that transplant's done. Um, but what you want to do, ideally, is have two or three potential donors going through the workup process. So if one or two of them gets disqualified or they back out because they don't want to go forward, you still have other donors in the pipeline. So um, very key item. Um, also, you can't talk someone into donating. You don't even try, right? If somebody has a has a propensity to want to donate, you don't need to sell them on it, right? They've already in their mind said, look, I'm, I'm going to do this, or I, I've thought about doing this before. It seems like a reasonable thing. Um, so don't even try to convince somebody, um, you know, just tell them what your situation is, tell them your story. Uh, people who 
have that propensity to donate, they're going to donate. You're not going to, you're not going to talk them into it. Um, and then uh, last tip is anyone could be a potential donor. I've seen this happen so many times where you have either a champion or a patient uh, and they have, uh, they have ruled somebody out of donating without ever talking to the donor. Um, I had a situation uh, where this one person was saying, oh, this lady can't donate because uh, she works in a deli and has to lift heavy things. Well, we have, you know, a program called Donor Shield where they, they can be reimbursed for up to six weeks of lost wages. So they can take the time off they need to heal and they won't have an income hit. And so this person had written the other, this potential donor off for something that was, you know, it would, wasn't really a blocker. Another one is trying to diagnose that person's medical situation. Oh, they can't donate because of this medical condition. You don't know. In fact, different transplant centers have different standards for who they'll accept and who they'll deny. And so we've seen situations where a donor, a potential donors decline to two transplant centers. They go to transplant center number three, number three accepts them because they're, they're more qualified to deal with that medical issue at transplant center number three. So don't rule out donors, let the transplant center evaluate the medical conditions. Let the transplant center talk to those donor candidates about all the programs that could come into play, like lost wage reimbursement, travel and lodging reimbursement. Um, and then the last, the last bullet point is I've seen a lot of this. It's a huge mistake uh, talking about donor recipient incompatibility. And, and unfortunately, we, we see a lot of this uh, conversation about incompatibility. Now, back when I was trying to donate to Samantha, there, there wasn't any other way around it because I, we, I, put our, I put us in about a dozen parent exchange systems around the country and none of them got us a match, right? That's back when parent exchange wasn't very well developed. Today, uh, most people are getting matched and transplanted in less than six weeks. Um, incompatibility is not an issue unless you have a CPRA north of 99% and very few patients have a CPRA that high, even above 99%, we can get those patients transplanted. So um, don't recipient incompatibility. Don't, you know, if it comes up when you're talking to somebody, just let them know it's no longer an issue. Um, you know, most people are, are the vast majority, nine, 98 to 99% uh, get transplanted very quickly through large parent exchange programs. You don't have to worry about incompatibility. Correct. All right, let me pause there. Take any questions on the donor search tips. Hey, Leanne, do you have any other tips for us? Um, <laughs> I could talk all night, so I'm trying to keep it quiet. I will just add a little funny thing. The donor search don't nothing is off the table, anything, but my husband's a little bit of a comedian. Those of you that met him, um, he got to the point where with just people that knew who he was, he'd say, well, you can either call this doctor and, and go through it this way, or I'm going to cut it out of you myself, but I no. need your opinion. I don't advise that. But. Yeah. Yeah. That actually brings up a good, a good point. Um, because I, I have met him and I, I know his, his humor. I, I enjoy it, but, uh, part of it is, is political and something that we, advise is um going through especially social media if you're going through a social media search um but your microsite as well is take that sort of thing out um don't give people an easy out okay well i don't agree with this political thing that you you know have on your on your twitter from four years ago just remove that don't don't make that even a, a thought or an issue um yeah totally just, agree we've had that problem before of yeah. course uh, the other thing, just to add to um, anyone to be a potential donor, um, the other thing is don't necessarily um, keep people for who, who want to donate from, from doing it for a reason. And it, the example that I've heard uh, was a man whose granddaughter expressed interest in donating, but he said he didn't want her to donate because that was, he didn't want that, he didn't want her to go through that um, and have that surgery because it might hurt her. And what uh, actually the, the surgeon at that transplant center said to him was, well, your granddaughter wants you to be around for her. So let, so take, take the hands off of, of that situation, because if she wants to, that's her right. That's her choice. Good point. Next slide. Uh, donor recipient compatibility is no longer an issue. So we're going to kind of hit this twice. Uh, 
So in the past, patients historically needed to find a compatible donor, uh, which could be difficult. Uh, simulations showed that 40% of donors out there uh, were incompatible or are incompatible due to blood type or antibody incompatibility, as well as many other forms of incompatibility. Those are the two big ones. Um, uh, so essentially over the last 14 years, uh, building the National Kidney Registry, we've eliminated donor recipient incompatibility. Um, in fact, um, uh, the majority of transplants are taking place, uh, it says here, uh, 1.6 months is the median wait time. So the majority happen in under two months. Uh, and we do have very, very few cases where it takes longer because these patients have like a 99.9% .9 CPRA, but that's very, very rare. Uh, so uh, the good news is you can don't have to worry about compatibility. If somebody is healthy enough to be a donor, that's all you need. Next slide. Uh, so here's another um, resource, right? We encourage everybody to go to our uh, Donor Shield website. Because why, why is this important? Because your champions are out there talking to people about becoming potential donors. They need to be educated on what uh, the transplant industry is doing for donors to make it easier to donate. So we're going to go through, I'll just hit these at a high level. Uh, you can look at more detailed information on the website. But the big thing is cost reimbursement. Lost wages are a big reason why people don't donate right? They can't afford to take four weeks off. Um, so we have a lost wage reimbursement program that will reimburse up to $1,500 a week for up to six uh, weeks. Now, look, if you're making more than $1,500, we'll still reimburse, but only up to the $1,500. Um, and then travel and lodging reimbursement, we will reimburse up to $3,000 in travel and lodging reimbursements. Uh, right now, it looks like that satisfies uh, the travel and lodging costs for 96% of our donors. Um, kidney prioritization. So this is uh, what happens if I donate my kidney and then I need a kidney later on. Well, uh, kidney prioritization is, uh, is given to every donor who donates through an NKR swab. Uh, if, if I need a kidney, I was an NKR donor in 2015. If I need a kidney 10 years from now, I'm prioritized to get a living donor kidney from the National Kidney Registry. We've got over 5,000 donors who've donated through the National Kidney Registry. Not a single one has come forward and said, I need a kidney. So the screening process at the hospitals is pretty tight. Um, and we don't expect uh, any, well, maybe someday we'll, we'll have one, but uh, kidney prioritization is to, is to kind of overcome that, that challenge where a donor says, well, what if I need it? A kidney someday. Well, you can get a living donor kidney out of the National Kidney Registry because you'll be prioritized. Um, voucher donation. This is really important. I've seen this uh, solve a lot of problems for potential donors. Um, so I'm a donor. I'm going to donate to somebody. I have a window to donate. That eight, that person I'm donating to has a medical problem and it delays their ability to get a transplant for three months. But that was my window. Well, the voucher program, uh, the donor donates whenever they want. Uh, and then they give the patient a voucher. The voucher, the patient can redeem that voucher anytime they want uh, and then be prioritized for living donor kidney. So it's a, basically a way to it decouples the pairs and parent exchange so that we can make it very convenient for the donor. They can donate any time they want on their time frame. They don't have to coordinate uh, with the, the, pa the patient. Not only, and I'll get to this in another item, but uh, generally we can find that patient a better match than if the, you know, the person donated, um, you know, because in probably only 1% of the cases are those really great uh, histocompatibility matches uh, but we can kind of turn that upside down. We see so many donors, we can get better matches for that voucher holder because we're drawing from a much larger pool. This is also very useful um, if there are health concerns or reasons that, that a patient is not necessarily eligible for transplant at that time. Um, you know, often with, with dialysis, there might be some, something going on in the donor and the recipient's life. Um, or in their health that keeps them from being able to go to surgery right away when the donor is available and therefore uh, removes that, that barrier as well. Yeah, we've seen also on the voucher side of things, we've seen a lot of cases where somebody wanted to donate a kidney, uh, the patient had a medical issue, they had to delay for a year or two, 
by the time they were ready, the donor was gone. You know, they had, they got another job, their life situation changed, they kind of given up. And so uh, the voucher uh, voucher program also eliminates that risk that you'll lose the donor uh, if, if things delay. Uh, the next item is remote donation. Another big one here. Um, you know, in the past, the donor had to fly or go to the transplant center where the patient was being transplanted. We don't need to do that anymore. Um, you could have a donor who's in San Diego. Uh, they donate their kidney and we re recommend that they donate uh, through the standard voucher program. Uh, the patient could be up in, I don't know, Boston. Uh, they, they activate their, their voucher and they get transplanted uh, with a donor kidney that maybe came out of Wisconsin. So uh, the remote donation eliminates that need for the donor to travel. Uh, we have 100 transplant centers in our network. We have a transplant center in every major city. Uh, so it's, it's unlikely that the donor would have to travel more than an hour uh, to get to one of our centers where they can donate and then they can basically offer that voucher uh, to the recipient. The Donor Connect is a new service that's coming online. Um, anybody who goes through the National Kidney Registry website to register as a donor automatically gets this. Georgetown just went live. University of Pennsylvania is about to go live. If you're at a center um, that has donor, this is this is University of Pennsylvania patients. So uh, UPenn is about to go live. But this is a very neat product where if the donor registers, they're given the option to talk to somebody who's a living donor. Um, and that, that the living donor can answer questions that nobody else can answer, uh, especially, you know, with somebody who may be nervous about the process, uh, talk to somebody who's gone through it. Uh, we see that there's a 300% a increase in donors that make it through the process uh, when they connect to a living donor through our Donor Connect uh, service. So the good news is uh, I think University of Pennsylvania is about to go live. Uh, if, if any of the patients on this call I have an opportunity to talk to the folks at Penn, just ask them, you know, when, when does Donor Connect go live? And, and hopefully it'll be soon. Um, we just um, had, had a raised hand from uh, Debbie. Oh, Debbie, go ahead. Okay, um, and I hate to backtrack, but I did want to mention on the microsites, uh, not, I think a good idea would be not to mention to have, or say, if would you test to see if you're a match? Because there are so many other options now. Um, uh, good point. Yeah, but Debbie is one of our coaches, and that is a very important point. Um, there, I do see uh, several microsite, many microsites coming through saying, "I'm an O blood type." I'm a B. Blood yeah, type. don't I mention know. your blood type. Don't. It's not necessary. Don't, don't talk about being <laughs> tested to be a match. That is old school. That's gone. Uh, just expunge it from the messaging. I've even recommended that they make a statement that say blood type is not a. And not a component anymore. Yeah, that's that's Great. good. Yeah, good point. Um, next item is the best match because the uh, NKR is uh, looking at not just all the antibodies, but also uh, the epilets that underlie uh, the antigens that we match on. Uh, a donor can be assured, you know, like I wanted to know that my kidney was going to go to somebody and that kidney, even though I didn't know that person, I want, to, I want my kidney to have a long life, right? And most donors care about that. And so, you know, you need to be able to, to talk to potential donors and say, look, you're going through a process where your kidney, it may not go to the person you, you're trying to help, but it's going to go to somebody. And because of the matching technology, um, that patient's going to have a lot of years on that kidney. Uh, and that's also supported uh, by our, our graft survival research. Uh, donation insurance. So there's two insurance policies we buy for every donor. One is a life insurance policy, $500,000 principal amount. Um, and the other one's a disability policy that will uh, pay out up to $1,500 a week for 52 weeks if somebody's uh, disabled from donating a kidney. We've never had a claim on the life insurance. We hope we never will. And on the disability policies, we've had very minor claims um, they, they're not even significant, but some people worry about that. They want to know what's going to happen if something really uh, untoward goes down. And well, the answer is we're, we're buying insurance, uh, legal support. Uh, this is important in the sense that we've actually had one or two donors out of 5,000 that were terminated unlawfully when they donated their kidney and had to take time off. Well, we're going to sue that employer and we win every time. It's really a hard thing to defend against. We will also 
if if you're denied health insurance because you know the donor donated, we're gonna we're gonna sue that health insurance company. And they, and in fact, we are. We're actually suing State Farm right now. Uh, but it's very rare. Actually, that's a life insurance company. We have never had a case where a health insurance company has done anything uh, other than support uh, living donors. So. You know, kudos to the life insurance or the health insurance industry. So the donors get legal support. Um, the donors also get protection uh, for uncovered complications. So if, uh, if, the, if the donor gets a hernia uh, six months later, uh, they have to take time off work. They have to drive somewhere. We'll reimburse the lost wages. We'll reimburse the travel costs uh, and make sure that that procedure is paid for. That's the complication protection. Um, reduce wasted time. We streamline the donation process to the extent we can. A lot of our centers uh, work with us to make that, to improve that process. That's we actually do, um, why another reason to send your donors to your microsite, because that, that button that, that we keep pushing here, uh, for yeah. register to donate for you, uh, goes through our uh, donor automated screening and history process, which makes the, the initial screening and general, you know, preliminary medical uh, testing far easier on the donor and for the donor because they can go to a local lab, they can do it from home, et cetera. Et cetera. Yeah, that's a very good point. But, donors who go through the microsite platform okay. have a much, much more streamlined process. Uh, and then we have home blood draws. Uh, so you don't have to drive to the transplant center to have blood drawn. You know, for me, it was New York no. City, an hour and a half away. Uh, kind of a pain in the butt. Um, and, and what you can do instead is uh, all of our centers are set up. They can ship uh, the kit to you. Phlebotomist comes to your home, does the blood draw at your home or your office. Uh, so we make that easier for the donors. Uh, and then uh, the last thing is we have a, we have a feedback collection me mechanism. So all donors that go through the process have the opportunity to provide feedback so we can help the hospitals improve the, the systems long-term. So I ran through these very quickly. Again, these are in detail on our website. Some of these things are important to some donors. Some donors don't care about some. So it depends on the donor, uh, but uh, your champions and, and the patients, the microsite patients need to know about all these donor support and protections so that if it comes up, you can educate the potential donor and maybe overcome an objection. Any questions on this slide? This is a big slide. We do have one question in the chat, uh, not necessarily about this slide. Um, what is exactly shared on the weekly emails about the microsite? Is it how many people clicked about donating or does it tell us their names? We cannot legally tell you any names, neither can the transplant center. Uh, that is protected information on the donor side, so the donor has privacy. Um, we do say how many uh, people clicked you know, on, on, on registered to donate. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that they went in and fully registered. That just means that they showed interest in that button. Um, we also show how many people came to your site. This is especially useful when you're doing um, a social media campaign or trying a, a, new, a new tactic for sharing your site um, because you can measure how, how successful that was. So maybe you put um, an ad in your church bulletin and you got, you know, maybe four or five new visitors to your site for over the next week or two. Well, then you share it on, on Instagram. And you get 30 new register, uh, 30 new unique visitors onto your site that the next through the next week. Well, that's telling you that Instagram is a better uh, option. Then again, the seriousness of those potential donors is a whole different. Yeah, it just question. gives you a general but, sense of the activity that you're driving, and if you're if you're looking at that and you're running different campaigns, it'll help you you know understand where to put your effort. Correct. All right, any other questions on the donor shield protections and supports? All right, next slide. Uh, slide 17, standard voucher program. So um, the standard voucher program is uh, the most effective way uh, to have a, a donor donate. Again, if a donor donates directly to the patient, uh, you're not able to necessarily optimize the match. Uh, the other thing that's a challenge is timing. You know, what if the, the patient's not ready to go to transplant, uh, but the donor is? Uh, this is this eliminates it. So how does it work? Um, your donor donates their kidney at a time and center or location that is convenient for them. 
Uh, and this, this includes remote donation and it avoids all air travel. By the way, if you're flying into a distant city to donate your kidney, you're told to stay in that city for a week after you donate your kidney. So you're now in a hotel room uh, for seven days for recovery. But it's not the optimal recovery. It's much better to, uh, to recover at home. A uh, patient then receives a voucher for a living donor kidney that can be redeemed at any time at any of the 100 NKR centers. When you are ready for the transplant, when the patient's ready for the transplant, the voucher is activated. You're prioritized to be matched for living donor uh, transplant. Most of those uh, matches and transplants occur in less than two, three months. Why it helps. It reduces the risk that you will lose your donor due to delays in the transplant surgery, right? I've seen this happen too many times. It simplifies the scheduling of the donor and recipient surgery because they're no longer linked, they're decoupled, right? It shortens the wait time because voucher holders are prioritized over paired recipients in the matching process. And it provides an opportunity for a better match for the voucher holder patient through the uh, NKR's Kidney for Life program, uh, which looks at uh, epilet matching. Uh, any questions on the standard voucher program? All right, next slide. Um, so I, I just briefly touched on the Kidney for Life program. Um, this is state-of-the-art uh, in histocompatibility matching. Uh, the theme is very simple, better matches equal better outcomes. So if you get a low epilet mismatch donor, there's kind of three categories. You got a low epilet mismatch and a medium epilet mismatch and a high. If you get a low epilet mismatch donor, it reduces the risk of what's called de novo antibodies, right? Um, and those are your body kind of waking up, figuring out this is a foreign organ, you know, and attacking it. So it reduces that probability, right? And because you have less de novo uh, antibodies, you have a lower risk of rejection and you have a lower risk of graft failure. You have a significantly lower risk of graft failure. Um, and so this allows that kidney to ideally go a lifetime. You also have an opportunity to safely reduce immunosuppression because uh, transplants that are great matches don't require as much immunosuppression. Um, and that obviously less immunosuppression diminishes the side effects from the immunosuppressive medications, which are, uh, you know, they can be challenging uh, and it's not something to be taken lightly. So if you can get a lower, uh, if you get reach a lower dosage of immunosuppressive safely, um, it, you're, you're better off long-term. As somebody who is on immunosuppressants himself, I will say the side effects from those they, they, they can, you know, intrude on your life a little bit, but they are far better than dialysis. So don't let the fear of that scare you in any way. Get you, The kidney is worth it. Yeah, good point. Um, Just to backtrack a little bit on eplets and what they are. Um, they're basically a, a more clear picture of an HLA match. Can we uh, mute, uh, Cheryl? Sure. There you go. There we go. Right, okay, mute. so... An eplet is uh, essentially what the HLA is made up of. So if you take an atom as the smallest uh, piece of matter, well, it's not because we figured out that if you crack it open, there's stuff running around in there that it that makes it up. That's basically what an eplet is. The eplet is the neutrons and electrons of an HLA. So just for a little backtrack on, on what an eplet actually is. All right, next slide. All right, so then this is kind of the final side. So how does this all work? People say, well, voucher program, paired exchange, what does it really look like? And this is a simple uh, depiction about how the process works. You have a voucher donor, you know, on the left side of this screen, they donate to a patient. And in this case, the patient had an incompatible donor. So uh, the patient's at top with the red, red kidney and the little heart thing there. Uh, and then down at the bottom, they have their, their paired donor. And their paired donor is now uh, freed up to donate to a voucher holder. So you can see how this whole thing works. We still have uh, pairs in the system. I don't think that'll go away. Um, but uh, most of our chains, this is a 2D chain. Most of our chains are started by voucher donors. Uh, they match either directly to a voucher holder or they match a pair. 
and that paired donor then donates uh, to a voucher holder that's been prioritized. So this is how um, the process works. 